thank you so much for coming out to a better presentation at the Museum of the Illusions. I, uh, like Jordan said, um, we were working off the um, generous grant from the Institute for Museum and Library Sciences to uh, collect, um, to work on our collections here, to bring them up to curation standards. We've inherited a lot of collections from um, excavations long ago that need to be um, pulled through and uh, inventory. We often don't even know what's in those boxes. They've been sitting there for 20 years. So this grant has gone a long way to so helping us get a grip on some of the things that we didn't quite know we had, um, but that we're responsible for. And so we want to have those records. Um, an introduction to me. My name is Kale Bruner. For those of you who don't know me. I'm a, I'm a research affiliate with the museum, which means that I'm here working kind of on temporarily as needed basis and um, very much uh, have enjoyed the time that I've spent working in the Illusions and with the museum. I began my work here in 2016, um, running around with the, like a chicken with my head cut off looking for a dissertation topic and found one here at the museum with um, the enormous amount of um, lithic tool collection that we have here at the museum. So I was able to um, pursue dissertation research and have had a, a great working relationship with the area and the museum since. I'm also very grateful to have the opportunity to work and to learn on and up the We have um, two future presentations coming up as part of this. Um, series from the IMLS. Um, just briefly, on September 9th, that's, that's a week from today, we're going to jump into one of the main collections that I am working with, with the IMLS grant, and that is what we call the Legacy Collection of William Laughlin, who excavated for decades along with his students at Nikolsky at the village site there in the um, Cultural Mount that dates back to about 4,000 years. And so we'll jump into that on September 9th, and then on September 15th, that's going to be a Thursday, if I'm not mistaken. Um, then we're going to do another lecture in the series looking at what Aleutian archaeology, um, based out of this institution, is going to look like over the next um, coming, coming decades. So I've got to stick close to my paper, um, or else I'll get really lost on the tangent. But anyway, I hope you can make these um, these other lectures in the next couple of weeks. We look forward to seeing you. So the presentation organization I have here, um, this is designed as an informal discussion, actually. And so I'm going to um, talk a little bit about what archaeology is, its history, um, why it's a science, and um, you know how that came to be. And then I'm going to do a very brief overview of the archaeological record that we know of in the Aleutian Islands. And this overview is designed for those of you who are familiar to be reminded of some of the details, and for those of you who are not familiar, as a, as a general, we will spend too much time talking about um, all of the details of each site um, to that. Um, then I'm going to jump into big research questions for today. Um, here at the museum, we're a state-of-the-art facility for um, archaeological collections. And we um, have researchers um, coming from all over the world to look at um, the material pool here um, to answer their research questions. And I'll give you a summary of some of what's been happening in the museum lately. And then really, I'd like to open it up. Um, I'd like to keep all of that kind of short, as, as I said, just sort of an introduction. And then I'd like to open it up to Q and A. Um, I'd love to hear um, answer any questions you have, or I can delve deeper into something you may be more curious about that I just um, didn't mention. And I kind of see that as being um, a discussion, which I'm more than happy to do. I would I would say jump right in while I'm presenting, except that we're filming, and so that might become a little discombobulating for the viewer later. So we'll hold on to the and then finally, I've handed most of you a sheet of paper. It has a survey of your questions. And we're just, the museum is just um, seeking feedback on what interests you in our presentations and what brings you to them and what will, what will keep you going, coming back to them. So thank you for doing that survey. You can hand it um, 
to one of the museum staff on the way out. Okay. <clears throat> So the history of archaeology, right, it's, um, we got to acknowledge it came, it grew out of uh, the scientific revolution of the mid-19th century, uh, and it grew out of, fairly directly out of colonial expansion. European powers are moving across the world, exploiting resources, and it's bringing them into contact with peoples who are living different life ways from themselves, and who um, uh, have produced wonderful monuments and works of art and different types of homesteads and what have you. And these sort of material items, if you will, caught the attention of many of these early colonial explorers. <clears throat> and it's also a time that we have an intellectual soup, if you will, with, with Darwin's um, publications on evolution. Um, Charles Lyell was looking at geology and saying, you know, I think the Earth may be a little bit more than 6,000 years old based on the depth of the stratigraphy in these rocks. And <clears throat> geologists are looking at glaciers and seeing them recede over time and then grow again. And so there's this intellectual soup in the late 19th century that archaeology is born out of that is acknowledging that the world has changed. It's not static. It hasn't stayed the same in all of this time. And Encountering people with different life ways than Europeans also is reiterating this idea that things aren't always the same, that there's change through time, which really becomes sort of the hallmark of doing archaeology is examining that change through time and attaching meaning to it. So <clears throat> initially, what one might think of as archaeologists were some of these folks upon, um, in a colonial context, who I mentioned, who were, you know, running around and seeing these extraordinary items, like the, the uh, pyramids in Egypt, for example, and they're actually, like, bringing these back and filling up European museums with these items from other places. And so this ethos early on of archaeology, even though it's adventurous and it's exploring, it's still, um, it's a matter of focusing on objects. It's, it's a glorified treasure hunting, if you will. Right? It's far from a scientific endeavor at that point. But as we move through time, we see archaeology start to become more systematic. And it stays object focused because objects are how we learn about people in the past. But the idea of excavating a site to get the goodies out of it. Is, is not part of the scientific approach to archaeology. And we see this in the Aleutians um, um, put into practice very early, actually, very early for the discipline of archaeology, even, to excavate in stratigraphic levels, to approach his excavations with research questions you'd like to answer based on change through time. Um, and this is Waldemar Jokosin, who was born in Russia, and became a um, ethnographer and linguist, and um, was part. Uh, he visited the Aleutian Islands in 1909 and 1910 as part of an expedition that was a, a mix of um, it was a combination of the uh, Russian Geographic Society and the American Museum of History, Natural History, the American Museum of Natural History. And so Yokelson, with his research team in the Aleutians, which included his wife, a medical doctor, Dr. Dina Brodsky, and the Toyon from Alaska, um, and I don't know his first name at that time period, but yeah, do you know that person? Andrew. Andrew, maybe? Andrew? Yeah, maybe we'll be. Um, yeah, Chmina, uh, was one of the key, um, key members of that research team. So Yokelson, is doing, putting into practice what three decades later archaeologists would give a name, and they call it the direct historical approach. And that is where you work from the known to the unknown. So Yokosun visits villages in the Aleutian Islands. He speaks with the known people. He learns from them. This is in, uh, in his uh, 
understand, I think he's recording language here, but he's also learning about the objects used in everyday life. The ulus, the harpoon points, the, the needles. The, uh, and so he's learning about these objects, as you can see depicted here in a, um, an early 18th century, uh, mid 18th century depiction of um, implements used in the daily life of a, an urban hunter. And the opposite is excavating at, I think, 13 different village sites across the Aleutians over these two years. But um, here on Alaska, he excavated a few sites. I mean, he's approaching his excavations stratigraphically, looking um, deep into these shell bays to look at the change in form of objects, to look at the change in abundance of objects. If we see a lot of ulus, what does that mean? But what if we don't see very many ulus, but we see a lot of harpoons, what does that mean? And he's actually um, then theorizing about people's lives changing through time based on the tools they're using in their daily lives. And this is very scientific, especially for its day. And archaeology, moving into the 20th century, um, was moving in this direction, but Yokelson was far ahead of the curve. <clears throat> so it goes without saying, as I mentioned, archaeology is inherently going to be an object-based study, we study material culture, that can, which can be observed and seen. Um, and I think it would, by you know, the mid-20th century, this really solidified into an academic, you know, bona fide academic discipline uh, with the application of universal excavation protocols, not just willy-nilly digging and grabbing, but protocols for excavation and recovery, standardized across the globe, really, or anywhere archaeology was practiced. Um, you get the application of sophisticated technologies that are based in science, like radiocarbon dating, for example, which is all about the physics, but it can tell us a lot about putting a, a point in time on, on these different layers as we move, we work our way down. <clears throat> and then in addition, American archaeologists, at least not as much in Europe, but American archaeologists embraced the rigors of the scientific method for structuring their, their research. So that means material-based observation, hypothesis, testing, conclusions, modifying as the data, new data is coming in and to be um, complete and to sort of adjust with new data sets, if you will, right? And so again, I, um, with these scientific tools, stratigraphic excavation, and uh, a focus on the objects of everyday life, archaeology is really posed in the mid-century, 20th century, to provide a very, very unique window onto the past. Um, now, as again, most of you who um, we like the pretty objects, right? We like the, these pretty objects. And um, there's still a good bit of a, you know, you find something special, we can do and we all over it. The, the workmanship, the, 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 you know, random chance that it was preserved and found to look at in the future. Um, but the fact is, is for any of you who've worked on an archeological site or you've worked in the lab with us, you know that not everything looks, most archeology span doesn't look like that. Most archaeology looks like this. It looks like a lot of fish bone around here, around these parts, other mammal bone, um, sea mammal bone, um, other bones. Um, it looks like a lot of tools that are the debris, a lot of artifacts that are the debris from making tools. They're not even formed tools themselves. They're just the discarded debris. Like these chips of, um, sorry. Like these uh, like chips of stone, for example, which there are boxes, boxes, boxes of, because these midden sites that are so common here in Alaska and the Aleutians produce hundreds of thousands of these types of artifacts with every, um, you know, 
seized from excavation. So sorting through this and making sense about the past through this is much more what archaeology is about now than it is looking, finding the pretty objects. So one thing I like to say about the archaeological record in the Mission Islands is that it's it's deep time and it's big geography. There's a lot of space to cover. Not even if you think about the 12,000 miles from the Schengen Islands to Attu, all of these coastlines and they're so indented um, are all um, most, as you can see from the pink dots, contain archaeological sites. And this is just a snippet of what it looks like at the east. There are well over 2,000 sites reported across the Aleutian Islands. Some of these are historic or World War II in nature, but a good many of them represent Anungan villages or other um, Anungan sites. I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. Um, but just to point out the magnitude of the archaeological record we're dealing with um, further is that not only do we have 12,000 miles and very indented shorelines to um, survey and assess, but we know that people have lived in the Aleutian Islands for at least 9,000 years. Um, so how did we get all these sites on the map? That's a big, that's a big question. Um, Yelkelson's work in the early 20th century was some of the first very scientific work that was done. And he excavated the sites where, you know, um, locals at the time told him where the, where the sites were, that's where they were excavated. And so we got, we didn't, we knew, we learned some that way, you know, as a discipline. But it wasn't until um, the post-war years that archaeology, archaeology got done in the Aleutian Islands um, in a more of a high year, let's say. The first of these was um, university expeditions with like Theodore Bank and William Laughlin. And they were um, working uh, across the chain. Both of them also worked on Alaska briefly. Um, and then also Laughlin's students went on to have great careers in Aleutian archaeology in Alaska. Um, Gene Eidner, Doug Veltry, uh, Peter, Alan McCartney, you know, to name a few of, of Laughlin's students. So the so that was the beginning of sort of piecing together what we know about the history of these um, settlement in these islands. But um, it wasn't until the 1970s with the uh, Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act me, that the BIA archaeologists spent about a decade surveying every spot of relatively level land across the entire Aleutian chain. They were doing that on behalf of to establish boundaries for the newly developed regional and village corporations and um, the placement of archaeological sites in relation to those, into those tracts of land. And so that's when we saw the number of sites that we know about explore, exponentially explode. Um, and, then, and then with that, several sites um, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, being a bunch of the land was on, a um, bunch of the land survey um, had been U.S. Fish and Wildlife land before it was conveyed. Um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service also then had um, very intensive surveys through the 80s and 90s to just get a handle on how much archaeology is out there in the Asian Islands. <clears throat> Um, and last but not least, the reason I also consider it to be um, an exceptional place, never mind the, the rigors of working here, um, logistics of getting out to some of these remote locations to conduct an excavation, but the people who have lived here in the Aleutian Islands for 9,000 years, the Anungan, have a very unique specialized maritime adaptation that we don't see anywhere else in the world. It's in no other place is there the reliance on um, the marine 
ecosystem to the extent that there is here in the Aleutian Islands. And we see that go back 9,000 years. And so that alone makes this a really unique and interesting place to study just the variability and diversity of human adaptations. So we have that 9,000 years of history and we divide it up into some time that hopefully has a little bit of meaning to us as archaeologists. This is really just so that we can talk to each other as archaeologists. Um, each of these divisions um, has some hallmarks that go with it, which I'm going to review really quickly. And I don't necessarily want you to remember the sequence here, but what you're looking at is the cultural sequence for the Eastern Aleutians as we know it today. Um, earliest evidence um, known so far for 9,000 year old occupations um, at Hog Island, right out here. Um, and also um, another 9,000 year old site is found in the Kolsky Bay off of Anakula Island. So these early folks um, seem to be doing something pretty different than those who, you know, who settled in more a few thousand years later. They carry this very distinctive tool type with them called microblades. Uh, this is a core for producing a microblade. It would have been uh, a small, uh, almost exacto like knife um, blade inserted into a shaft to use it as a knife or in combination with a projectile um, for a thing. Um, these are really common across Alaska, um, even earlier than 9,000 years ago. But uh, they are not, and then in Siberia too, I might add, they're sort of a subarctic or a subpolar um, phenomenon up until about 3,000 years ago. But those folks who came out here first were definitely relying on this technology. They also were fairly mobile, and we know that because they invested very little in living structures. It seems they were on the move quite a bit. The few um, bits of evidence we have on living structures are tent post, um, post molds, which we assume supported a tent, and uh, some shallow hearths um, not built up with rocks or anything, very ephemeral. And that, that changes, though, with the following phase, the late Anagula. During the late Anagula, although we do have a hiatus, we don't really see sites in that seven to 6,000 year range very much, probably because this region was still recovering from the massive um, caldera forming eruption from Bakushi, right? We were about 9,000 years ago and would have wrecked the ecosystem here for easily a moisture. But by about 6,000, we start to see more sites with higher investment in uh, housing, you see this is a, a house wall or a semi-subterranean house, what would be called a quadra or a hula. And um, you can see behind is shown that it's accumulated. You see living like this accumulates for food refuse, and you know the people have been living there a long time. Probably a lot of people there for a long time. So by the late Yamagula phase, we're still here. Four to seven to four thousand years ago, we see an increased investment in housing. People aren't as mobile; they're not getting around in tents the way they seem to have been before, um, and they're creating these shell mounds. With the next phase, we have not too much change from what was happening already, but the introduction of this new tool type, which is um, a very small projectile, probably used in an arrow. So what we see with the Margaret Bay phase is the introduction of the bow and arrow. Um, these points are very small, they're maybe, maybe an inch or so at most. Um, it's not to say that the late and early Anagula folks didn't have and use projectiles and darts and spear points, they certainly did, but this is the first we see um, points that probably um, headed on an arrow. So bow and arrow technology. In the following phase, um, getting closer to the present year, um, oh, I'm sorry, BP, guys, that's before present, 
sorry, I forget it sometimes. <laughs> so yeah, that's the years we're talking about, 9,000 years ago, 9,000 to 4,000, okay? Um, so yeah, so now we're moving closer to the present here, we're in the Amacnac phase, and um, this site of, um, sites from this phase are very common here in Alaska Bay, the Amacnac Bridge site fits into this time period, the upper levels of Margaret Bay site right outside our door here fit into this time period. The uh, Min site that we're excavating over at Agnes Beach fits into this time period. And what we see is um, even more extensive uh, utilization of stone light housing and, um, um, and closer space together. And um, hard features, wait, this doesn't really show it as well as I'd like it to, but hard features which actually have a channel that will run the heat under, um, a rock line channel that will run the heat under the floor to mm -hmm. heat up more space, distribute the heat throughout the structure. Um, and during the Magnac phase, we also see a proliferation of bone technology. And um, not only your functional pieces like these harpoon points, um, but a lot of decorative material, pins, um, objects, of no known function, um, regrets, of course, which are um, ones being worn in the face. So the Imagnac phase is, in a lot of ways, really ramping up in terms of population density and in terms of um, uh, artifact types are just um, becoming more and more numerous and diverse. And then finally, we move into the Aleutian tradition which is really known for things like imported materials. We have um, slate ulus uh, make their appearance during this time period. Other imported items from the east, um, rare stones that don't occur out here, like jet, for example, um, obsidian all the way through the Wrangell Mountains in, uh, in mainland Alaska. So we see that there's a huge, this is a time period that marks a huge expanse in social trading networks. Um, and an in, continual increase in population. And then this is, the, this is the, the matrix, the cultural matrix, if you will, that was in process when the Russians arrived in the late 1700s. Kind of disrupted much of what was going on at the time, but um, but not everything. So that's just a quick summary, really brief overview of what the archaeological record in this area looks like. And I also want to add that all of this, all of this time sequence that I've just mentioned is all present here in Unalaska Bay. Unalaska Bay has been a very popular place to live for, for these 9,000 years. So moving on, what are some of the big questions that researchers are asking when they come to the oceans? Um, well, first, um, I boiled them down to th like three basic genres here. Um, different researchers are, at, are researching uh, certain aspects of the, these questions, but from both. Um, but from both an archaeological perspective, where we can see an increase in, in house density, um, you know, faster fa settlements that are larger in extent that contain more and more maybe deposit, we can definitely see an increase in population happening around 5,000, probably starts a little bit earlier. And the genetic data using both modern and ancient DNA also show an expansion of the nomad population at this time. And so um, the reasons are unknown for certain, um, but there is some general idea that uh, the population density may have been even more dense to the east of the Fox Islands um, on the lower Alaska Peninsula and then um, on Umnak, which of course is a nomad cultural territory as well. And that the uh, volcanic eruption of Antiochchak at 4,600 may have caused some displacement, and people may have moved out towards the um, 
towards the west into the Aleutian Islands um, to join their kin, basically. Um, and then we see, but we also see a continuum of westward expansion all the way across the chain. And we see our oldest sites on the far, on the farthest west island of Attu around 4,000 years ago. And so um, this population expansion may have um, um, serves to populate the entire Aleutian chain. Um, and the second is the um, paleo environment, the neoglacial. Is that a new is that a new phrase for you all? Uh, the neoglacial is a period of extreme cold that happened between about four thousand five hundred years ago and about two thousand five hundred years ago, and it's very well documented with the growth of glaciers all through southwest Alaska, um, lowering sea temperatures. Um, it's a it's a phenomenon that occurred. What we don't know about is how intense the cold was it here in on Alaska or the eastern oceans in general. And so there are some indications based on um, the kinds of animals collected from archaeological sites here on Alaska Bay that there may have been seasonal seasonal sea ice here, and potentially hunters would have had to change their hunting strategies from open water hunting to sea ice hunting, at least during some parts of the year, whether that be sea ice um, margins, hunting along the margins, or, or hunting of reading holes like this in the shirt and things. And this is a big open question. We don't know how intense the paleoenvironmental change was, and we don't know, we know it didn't affect the population in terms of hardship and decline, because we see population growth at this time. Right? But we don't know what the specific technologies were there to help people adapt to these changes if they were, in fact, dramatic and prominent in their lives. So neoglacial falls under the general paleoenvironmental question, which is a big one here. And then the third is the question of, of social organization changes during the late evolutionary period. Um, remember, I, I said that that last 1,500 years, we see um, a lot of imported goods, mostly from the East, um, implying cultural trade relations um, to the East. But we see a pretty dramatic shift in housing styles from a, uh, the typical Paragra or Ula, which is a, you know, a semi-subterranean um, pit within oxide covered uh, Roof, um, which is very well adapted to the conditions out here, um, we see a, we see that shift from being single family or extended families in size to becoming very enormous, and the shape changes a little bit to the point that we call them long houses. They're squared off and they're long, in some places um, up to a couple hundred feet in length. And so these houses were designed to hold multiple families. These houses could have held small villages. Um, it's not a, it's, it's a, it's a social change reflected in living arrangements. Long houses. Long houses. Long houses. You know what I mean? Long houses. Um, other things we see during this um, same time period are um, an increase in ceremonial structures, um, the investment in, in building ceremonial structures, including elaborate burials. Um, and those longhouses um, are not a single family endeavor, right? That's, that's a cooperative effort to build something like that. And so we see cooperative technologies starting to show up. And whaling, for example, could have been one of those tech cooperative engagements. If there is evidence for some whaling at this later period of time. And so, and then along with the population increase and these social changes, we also see warfare both in between villages and um, across the region, especially um, between um, here and Kodiak. And so, what are the causes of these changes is um, some of the key areas of research that's being done um, regionally.
So that brings me to um, what, is, what is MOTA doing to support these research questions, um, which is uh, kind of something I hope to uh, bring to your attention if it's not something that you're already aware of. Um, MOTA has a state-of-the-art facility. We house well over 500,000 archaeological objects, which is, um, and those objects are owned by the um, Onwashka Corporation, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and the BLM for the most part. Um, uh, and those, and we hold them as a repository in keeping them safe, conserved, um, and available for research. Most important, right? So recently, in the, in the last five years, um, and this was just me tallying up who's been through here. In the last five years, we've had two um, NSF, NSF funded research programs that are focusing on um, alien environmental changes. And they're doing that in different ways. Um, one group is looking at the size of cod, how cod size has changed through time, and how that may be a reflection of um, ecosystem health. Um, <clears throat> and The other is looking at um, oxygen isotopes to look at that in shell to actually see if um, see the balance of uh, cold to warm water isotopes. They show up in the in kind of clam shells, which is also what the dissertation on the historical production for Acadia Free Systems in Alaska Bay is working on. Um, uh, Christine Bassett is taking um, modern samples and then comparing them to archaeological samples and comparing this uh, isotopic ratio in order to get a, a, um, get a baseline of the amount of change in the ecosystem um, over a certain period of time. There's been um, a dissertation and a master's thesis uh, assessing changes in bone and shrill technology through time in Alaska Bay. The dissertation was mine. I finished it. and. Uh, I wish I had more answers. It led me to more questions, which is good that I get to keep, uh, keep hanging around here trying to get those answers. Um, uh, the museum continues its collaboration with the Japanese Science Foundation funded research on the history of volcanic eruptions and their impacts on human settlement with our um, colleague, Mitsuru Okuno. Um, here we are looking at a tap reception. Um, I think that might be the one that one needs to have. Um, and we continue to collaborate with the Russian Academy of Sciences on the construction of coastal ecosystems in time and again in order to assess the, um, degree, the degree and directions of climate change in this area. Um, staff, have I forgotten anyone else who's been through here recently? Did you include Trevor and? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, there was one, um, I forgot, Marianne Admiral, who was looking at the residues left on um, cooking pots. And, um, and she looked at residues across the Arctic to look at what people were eating. Because believe it or not, after thousands of years, you can still scrape a few lipids off of a, off of a piece of the salt that was used to cook with. And uh, um, learn if it was fish or if it was sea mammal. Um, shellfish, etc. So that was another dissertation project that utilized material from these. And then, now yeah, I just wanted to give you a heads up, an idea of what the museum was up to. We're very active with research, um, facilitating it for the most part, but um, we also have some um, engagements we're doing on our own. Um, this year, Moda had um, two interns, Alicia Peters and, and Riley Lucano, um, and they were internships sponsored by the Alma Corporation and the Ocean for Bluff Island Community Development Association. Uh, we put Alicia and Riley to work doing all kinds of stuff. Um, they were both excellent help in archaeology in the field. They also spent time um, working in collections, digitizing archives, um, which is a slow and tedious task that really needs to be done. Um, uh, washing artifacts, 
was also one of their regular tasks. And I, I've never seen anybody wash a bag of fish bones faster than Riley, and so I that's impressive. And I hope she'll come back and work with us some more. Um, and then uh, we also received some funding from the uh, Alaska Community Foundation grant to support youth and science. And so this summer we hosted um, between 10 and 13 little ones out at our excavation at Agnes Beach. And um, we had a great time. This class was hosted um, with the uh, help from the PCR. It was a PCR class. And <clears throat> We have them out digging with us, screening, um, every, basically every aspect of, of field work. They wash artifacts, we have them in the lab um, analyzing, um, which of course starts out with sorting what's the bone, where did, where did you know, get the stone, and how many of each do we have, and this and that. Those are the first steps in creating a scientific database, and so we had great help from them, and I hope they had as much fun as we did. Doing this and look forward to doing it again next year. Well, and we also, um, we also, as as we have in the last five years, I think, um, we um, are happy to continue working with um, the Kalamba tribe and to participate in Camp Q. We um, also excavate with um, kids. We have an archaeology class through the camp, and um, we can, again we take kids out learning the importance of careful excavation and documentation and um, also just the excitement of being able to find some cool stuff in the ground. So it's been uh, it's been a busy summer, a busy year here at the Museum of the Oceans. And that pretty much wraps it up there for me. Um, I can say my thank yous um, to our funders and supporters. Open the, open the floor to you if you have questions or comments or, you know, want to talk about any of these topics, evolution archaeology in more depth, I'm more than happy to. Um, I don't know the answer, but perhaps someone else will find So, uh, early on, I forget, I, just, I forget the name, but um, the archaeologist who was here in 1909 or 1910. Yeah, when he was said in the picture, you talked about he was uh, doing audio recordings. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if there's any record of those that still exist. They do, yeah, they do. Um, the Smithsonian, I believe, has, has those. And you know, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, what you said that ADA is. ADA. I would say, and we some of the reports or the record. Right. Those, that's what those are, right? Yeah. Right. So the ABC and the story. Uh, maybe. It comes with sleeves of Douglas and Turkey. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. I have another question. Yeah. So, um, I, my world timeline is uh, lacking. So, okay. pretty, so, but, um, okay, so it was around. Basically, my question is you talked about like, a westward expansion from the peninsula. Mm -hmm. Um, but going off of the model that, you know, there was Eastern expansion, you know, sort of originally populated in these areas and from, you know, kind of across like, the Americas. Yeah, mm -hmm. and coming across like Varangia and stuff. What, what's the timeline yeah. there? And then, yeah. That's a great question. Occur. It's a great question. It totally ties in. Um, so, so what Steve was referring to is that um, there's a sort of a migration out of northeast uh, Siberia that we know about, about um, no later than 14,000 years ago, because that's our earliest sites in Alaska, about 14,000 years old. So by that time, people had walked across the Bering Land Bridge, and Ice Age had the sea levels down, and so there was exposed land hundreds of square miles. It's, uh, it's not, um, it wasn't a bridge, it was, it was a a small country, and we call it Laringia. And people, it was exposed for probably seven or eight thousand years. And so people actually not only walked across it, they lived on it. 
And so by 9,000 years ago, when we see people here in, in the oceans, um, sea levels were rising and Georgia had just become submerged. So you can imagine that up until 9,000 years ago, the edge of Laryngia was getting soggy, if you will, right? And then the sea, um, it was becoming marshy and not the habitat for mammoth and horse and camel that had them before bison did. And so um, as we see the seawaters rise and the um, ice earth is melting off the Alaska Peninsula and the ice is melting off the Aleutian Islands, then these islands become habitable where they probably weren't before. And we know that these are being displaced off Laryngia because it's flooding. And so how many of those people morphed their way down to the White Cape Delta area and ended up on the Alaska Peninsula following a general maritime way of life? Um, it's, it's not known, but it's a good idea that that could happen. Yeah, so it follows that. Can I ask a whole quick question? In the news every few years, we pop up a different date of the Americas, with the earliest settlements. And yeah. Currently, not necessarily where they came from, because so that's not known, but what's the oldest they're thinking in Europe? Well, securely dated and accepted right now is 14,200 years ago, and, and that site is at Swan Point in, um, in Central Alaska. Oh, so it is. That's still the sort of the mainstream three, and then these other things, there's news yeah. stories that we. Yeah, well, there's the 20,000 year old bones with cut marks on them, and then there's the, what was the one in San Diego, 300,000 year old? I don't know, they just keep talking about the news every yeah. few years. And there's some compelling material coming out of South America and also the North Yukon, um, which could well push us back 20, 25,000 years. Um, we just haven't found the right site to call, call that certain yet. But 14 is certain. Yeah, and so when, there's going to be a lot more coming out, too. Um, I think these footprints that were recently found in Arizona have a date on them of around 19,000. And that's based on, you know, the date of the ash that fell on them. That's, that's not a bad dating technique. And so um, we could be looking at, you know, another situation where footprints are, you know, what we have instead of tools. Because that's the question with a lot of these really early sites is why are the tools there? We see you go to any other archaeology site and there's dozens and dozens of stone tools, or flakes at least. And we see a lot of these ones that are being reported don't have that. Karen Rock found which is really super basic. For like the stone tools particularly, how do you date their institute in the time of You can't because they're stone. So you um, if you want to use radiocarbon dating, you have to date something organic and it, usually we get a date on stone tools or any sort of assemblage of tools based on their association with something that's been dated like a hearth and so they're in the same stratigraphic level even sometimes you can clearly see a house floor you know and that's how we get a date that we can attach to an object of stone okay yeah so there is the marine I don't know about Beringia, but I just recently read about someone who's going to be doing some um, shipwreck diving out in that too. Yeah. I don't know about that. Yeah. Yeah. Is that the um, grad student from East Carolina? Yeah. Yeah, he actually contacted the museum last spring, um, and we might end up being at least tangentially related to that project. Um, and it's going to be a full underwater survey. They're not looking for anything in particular. They just want to know what's down there from any period of time because there's been no like un there's no there's been no real like underwater research in that region at least so far with a lot of more modern techniques. Um, so they just want to go out and see what whatever's out there, whether it be World War II or ten thousand years ago. Interesting choice of locations. <laughs> <laughs> well, Oh, yeah, no, well, so there's this uh, a, a footprint site in, uh, I think it's Arizona, it's in the desert southwest. Um, and it's called White Sands, I guess you guys know. Anyway, um, it's foot, human footprints. It's a, um, an adult and a child, and they are um, walking through a wet volcanic ash. And then that got covered up, and so it's dateable, but they left no material items. 
they did cross paths in the sloth, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, I guess this would be more a question for next week, but if you pull Steve, you know, you hear about it being the or one of the oldest continuously inhabited, uh, uh, what do you call it, grave sites. Oh, yeah. uh, and I'm wondering what the latest is on that, slash how, are there other contenders or for, for that? Uh, um, yeah. No, it's up there. It's, I mean, if you include the occupation on, um, Anagula, which is just an island off of the coast of Chile, then yeah, you're looking at 9,000 years of habitation, and they're right there. And the, and the village itself is on top of the old village. And so um, that's a that's a 4,000 to 5,000 year old record right there. So it's unique. It's it's pretty special. It's unique. Um, there are other old, old places, um, not to the Americas that I can think of, but People point to Jericho a lot because there's a modern city on top of um, on top of a very old city that you can't reach back to. That's kind of around the same. Jericho's like under ten thousand years old. Don't quote me on that. It's been a while since I took a picture of archaeology class. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's up there. It's very special. And, and I mean, you see here in the Aleutians, there's so little land that's actually habitable. If you're not getting run off because of volcanic eruptions or getting run off because of, uh, you know, you know uh, tsunamis or something, places become just stay, stay occupied. Is there any literature about how many villages are on <coughs> the Polsky side of the island versus on the West Island, which is about 19 on one side? I read, um, when Watson started his work in the Polsky, I think he said 13. Yeah, 13 that the villagers were letting, telling them about. Yeah. Yeah. On that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll have better numbers for you next time. You know, um, and I know we've talked about this um, between you and me about um, kind of placing the, the lithic tools and how, you know, what specifically they were used for, like in terms of kayak fitting. And then, um, and then, how certain aspects of the kayak fitting would have been done, and you know, it's kind of scratching our head at that. But I'm wondering, as I'm sitting here listening, um, I know I have a curiosity about that, and you do. But mm -hmm. what, what uh, bigger part of the science might that um, sort of answer? Or what you know, where could that lead? Do you have any ideas? Well, I, I think you could do a couple of things. I mean, I think it's. You know, kind of my pet peeve in one way is that, you know, people, we tend to focus on those fancy tools, things that look like what they are, like it looks like a scraper, it looks like a projectile point. Um, I deal with all of the debris, the stuff that seemingly was discarded. Like in, in these Aleutian sites, there is so, like, it's an enormous amount. Like it's enormous, it's so many that it seems to be that they're being produced on purpose. It's not only discarded, it's being these large flakes. So what are they using these large flakes for? So if we were able to replicate some new square and do some high magnification and, and if we could, you know, like best case scenario, demonstrate that these flakes aren't just debris, they're actually tools that have been used, they just haven't been chipped in modified shape and in a particular shape, then that would change how all archaeologists think about what we call the debris. You know, because well, actually, it might have been a specific kind of tool. It just doesn't have that that repeated template that like a knife would or a projectile point would. And so that could really open up, you know, a lot for the archaeological nerds to think about. You know, you know, you can't just write it all off. You know, it's that it's all tools. We have to be a but in broader terms, I think that the real sort of living aspect of what it takes to produce a sophisticated piece of technology, a kayak. And not only was it sophisticated, it was reliable and it was necessary. There was, 
there was no living on these islands without secure watercraft. And so um, to be able to tie that to the most lowly artifact, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Catch eyes. You mentioned the uh, Christian eruption. Is that you said there was like a thousand year window where there was kind of a hiatus from the area. Is that sensitive? Seems to be, yeah. And, and, and so is it, the, the caldera that we see today, is that basically from that event? Yeah. No. Yeah, that's the one. And I don't have the, the precise date on that. I know it's, it's been, they really teased out that there were three major eruptions, all within about 500 years. Um, but it, to me, it looks like it's one big flow, like an orange pyroclastic flow. And that would have just, that kind of activity would have been so we even, I mean, this is dramatic and may or may not be the case, but the reality is, is that that 9,000 year old campsite on Hog Island is, lies directly underneath that pyroclastic flow. Now, rather that the Tito stone tools had just sat on the surface for a hundred years, or had just been left, you know, three days ago, or, or people were there using them when that pyroclastic flow came down, we don't know. But it puts a pretty, pretty big cap on that occupation that people are not going to come back to that spot for quite a while. One more follow-up is that: Have you found that people tend to tend to come back to the same locations? Yeah. Like after that time period, and then people sort of filter you back in. I imagine, like, hey, we can make it again. Did they? Did they? Did they typically re-inhabit the same? It seems yes, very much. It seems that these earlier. Early on the Gula, like, you know, a little more kind of tense, mobile, maybe they're just using the island or the bay system seasonally for resource extraction or what have you. Um, it seems like they're more permanent homes or somewhere else. Um, but by, by five, six thousand years ago, and then certainly after, we see such an investment in housing on the same spot again and again. And so, yeah, it seems to be that. Um, sea levels stabilized, the reefs developed, the, um, the, 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 you know, the um, distribution of food resources became very stable in time, and people stayed. Or if they left, they left for a generation and came back. Now this one on uh, the side of the bridge, that was unique because uh, plumbing was up the earliest sites of uh, not plumbing, but it was the uh, the channels um, under the floor for heat. Yeah. Yeah, the, the stone lung channels for heat. Hot water is going under the. Uh, no, hot air. Hot air because they were they were part of the draft system. Well, that'd be something. Hot water. <laughs> that was when they started making spots. That really? <laughs> <laughs> was the first spot out there. Yeah. I guess a follow up to that. Were they always burning wood? I, I was in the Outer Hebrides this summer, so similar to here, and they were burning the tundra. Yep. Was that ever a thing here? It was always driftwood. Actually, probably less driftwood and more um, peat and animal bone if we were making a fire fire. Um, but the uh, uh, sea mammal oil would have done a lot for heating a small space mm -hmm. and for cooking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what's really conditions. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that would be that would be an interesting question. The wood was too precious for other purposes, most likely. I I have a question. I hope it's relevant. Do scientists know when? The amount of people began weaving baskets. I wish there was a definitive answer to that from my perspective. I don't know. Um, I wonder if maybe what did the Anunnaki say about when they started weaving baskets? I don't know. Yeah, I don't either. I don't either. But that would be my question. That would be the question I would have. I think that um, basketry was um, obviously a heightened skill. Even by um, we know of it in the in that late Aleutian period, the last fifteen hundred years, but people um, around the world have been making.
gatekeep baskets for thousands and thousands of years. So there's no reason to think that the baskets weren't being made much earlier. We know nets were, we know line was, and we know that because we can see it. Um, even though the, the line, the net, and maybe baskets have decayed, or we don't have the preservation to see those things, we know people were fishing cod and halibut, which you fish with a line, right? And so um, line had to be there. We know they were netting fish, maybe netting seals too. And so nets also were being made. So there's no reason to think that baskets weren't also being made going back um, to the beginning, really. When we started out this lecture, there was Jocko study that did a or archaeology work in 1909 or 1910. Yeah. Did he ever come back again? No, I don't think he did. That was, did um, anybody follow him or do anything after he did? Yeah, I don't know. So he, is, he was really a pioneer in a lot of ways. Not much happened until after um, World War II. And that's when archaeology, again, from a scientific perspective, began to be practiced. Um, with he were they Michigan and really off he was at Oregon, Wisconsin. But in the intervening years, I did leave out Alex Kurdishka, um, mostly because I don't consider what he did to be scientific, and we're talking about um, in that sense, you know. Um, but he was certainly out here um, trying to learn about the history of the people um, and doing so by looking at um, mostly. And he was, a, he was an agent of the Smithsonian at the time, so he was very well sanctioned to do those things. But it was not, it's not something that in the, the field of archaeology today we really can say that that was a good work in any, in any way whatsoever. So, Malcolmson, on the other hand, gets, he gets, he's sort of like under the rug a little bit, but he was actually doing fantastic work um, at the head of his time. So. Um. Mostly, okay, when we're looking at drawings and um, it's, ever, it's always going to be about patterns for sure. <laughs> and, uh, uh, when we're looking at specimens that are drawn or collected or available to look at, most of it's like 200 years old, right? Mm -hmm. Because that was when people were coming through and collecting. Yeah. You know, that's like the oldest of it, right? That's and then um, you, you have access to a few things that, that predate that from burial caves, mm -hmm. right? But what is the, um, what is like the, the, the oldest pre-contact uh, material that you think is available? Regarding boats? Yeah. And crabs? Yeah. I don't, I, I know that there are, there are items in some of the caves that also have that have come back with dates on some objects as much as um, 11 or 1300 years. And so it's potential that some of the kayaks that are also in that association could, could date that old. Um, you know, in my mind, it wouldn't be a bad idea to, to um, do some reading about me on some of the kayaks. Yeah. That would, be, uh, that would help us answer that question. This is a good question. Um, there is a little bit of pottery um, on the Alaska Peninsula. I don't think pottery carried out to the oceans, but I do know that people substituted it with stone balls. Not just not the lamps, but actually they were anything else. Um, I, there's a little bit of a blind spot for me because pottery is always something that's sort of on the, you know, lower down in the stack of things I'm pursuing, but um, it's a good question and one I wish I did have a definitive answer to. So I'm going to have to look it up and find out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some of the soil. yeah, well, and your water, right? Yeah. yeah. There's a lot, there is some room to work with. Yeah, it wasn't, it certainly wasn't practiced. But that doesn't mean that it didn't happen in the past few specimens. Yeah. This might sound like a silly question, but yeah. the aliens, I mean, 
the day of Uruz, when they call it Uruz, where they have it, or just other parts of Uruz? I would love to know the name of the world of Um It's, did we have this conversation this morning? Okay, so, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I got, I got a little sidetracked because the amount of names in the is in group. So I, I actually forgot the name already. It's interesting because yeah. like microblades from 9,000 years ago that were so common all over Alaska, the Uru is common all over Alaska in, in this time period that it's common here in the oceans. But we had a different name for it. That we started to know. No, <laughs> sure. yeah. um, they seem to be an imported object, but then once they were imported um, as a style, and then, but then it seems to be that when they took them here and started creating them, them themselves, the transition. Um, so it was introduced as a, as a technology that, that was then adapted to the, the local needs. And we know that because the introduced ones are slate, and slate only occurs for the East on the last of the Sea Rock Island. But yeah, but, but here we see people grinding um, pretty fine grained salt down. They can do with the rock that's here. Check into that question you just asked, we'll carry a pocket knife. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. We, we got to. Yeah. 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 The thing, the very first picture you showed, the old blue, I think the microphone. The microphone. Oh yeah, what was it? What was it made of? I mean, stone. A nice, a nice fine grained shirt. Mm -hmm. um, excellent stone for creating very fine tools out of. Doesn't occur around here. People were bringing their shirt from far away. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a special kind of rock. 